All right, so good afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming today and joining us online. My name is uh, Taylor Clem. I'm the County Extension Director, Horticulture Extension Agent, and Master, Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator here with UF IFAS Extension, Nassau County. And today I want to talk all about our Floor Friendly Landscaping Program and the FFL uh, in the community. So this is actually our third uh, program that we do as part of our Florida Friendly Crash Course series. And this program we do on a quarterly basis. And today we're going to be talking a lot about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program in the context of our communities that we live. Uh, because, you know, there's different ways that we can look at the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and how it can be used um, throughout our county. But anyways, so we'll talk a lot about those resources. We'll talk all about how we can use Florida Friendly from the perspective as a homeowner, but also as a maybe a leader in our community, a decision maker in our community, or someone that wants to work with our communities to help adopt some of these different Florida Friendly landscaping practices. So um, before we get going, I want to ask everybody, and you can put your response in the chat box. Um, when you think of a Florida Friendly landscape, if you're familiar with it, um, what do you think of? And you can put that in the chat box, please. I like that, wildlife sanctuary, great. This is new. I can add little emojis to responses. <laughs> Native and natural, tall, spiky plants. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, you know, such a great thing about it is it's not an aesthetic guideline. It's just a management guideline, which is a great thing because Florida Friendly Landscaping, you know, lots of green, green color, a lot of aesthetics, absolutely. But the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is just a way for us to really understand how are we managing our landscapes? What are the impacts of our landscapes? Why is it important? And how as Floridians can we do our best to help have a sustainable or just a, land, a sustainable landscape, but a Florida friendly landscape? So today's program, I want us to answer a couple. Oh, sorry, I want to talk about why is it important? I forgot about these slides. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a statewide initiative that we have. And when we look at the state of Florida from our projected population growth, this shows the state of Florida in this map from uh, 2005, looking at our population. So the red that we see in this image is those developed areas. So, you know, neighborhoods, communities, cities, schools, institutional areas, et cetera. The green parts are all like parks, conservation easements, et cetera, things that are gonna be natural areas. And the rest is kind of like rural agriculture, et cetera. So when we look at Florida's population growth, we expect that the population growth is gonna double by 2060 or 2070. And we actually know that about, or approximately a thousand people a day are moving into the state of Florida. That's a lot of people. And Northeast Florida is one of those fastest growing parts of the state, as well as the central and Southwest portions of the, uh, the state as well. So when we look at existing development trends and practices, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at these development trends and practices, we can kind of anticipate where that developed land will look like with an anticipated growth and change. So, and this is what that population is expected to look like, that urban developed landscape. So you can see Nassau County up in the Northeast, but you can see how much that is anticipated change. And this is from the specifically looking at 2060 population projections. So Florida is changing. Florida is changing rapidly. It is wildly different than when I was a kid. Um, and I know many people believe it from when they were kids or past generations that Florida's changed. Florida's changing dramatically and we're seeing how much it changes. It's important for us to think about how do we fit within the context of our environment. So 
One that way that we're thinking about this population changing is we're going to see an increased demand for water. It's already happening. So there's going to, if we're expecting a population change, there's going to be increased demand for water. There's going to be an increased pollution. And that increased pollution will come from every potential non-point source or point source pollutants that impacts our water bodies, um, but as well as, um, can you all hear me or is it too quiet? I can switch to another one. Let me switch to another microphone. Maybe it'll be louder. One moment. Okay. Is that better? It might be a little bit louder all of a sudden. Can you all hear me? There's a couple of people that are hard time having a hard time hearing the audio. So I want to make sure that's loud enough. So it should be a little bit louder. Okay, sorry. So when we look at Florida's population, um, when we look at Florida's population, we know that there's going to be increased demand for water. There's going to be increased pollution to our water bodies, but as well as we can see decreased habitats throughout this, the state where we're that can't no longer filter a lot, filter a lot of that polluted water. So pollutants enter our waters more easily and that runoff before it enters the aquifer as well as decreased wildlife habitat. So, you know, we're really looking at the land use is changing, our water demands are increasing, and that can increase the pollutants that we have in our waters. And we see in the state of Florida some impacts related to non-point source pollutants or pollutants that get in our waterways. And our landscapes are contributors and are part of those contributions. Um, so when we actually look at our landscapes, we know that approximately 60% of homeowner water use is associated with lawn and landscape irrigation. That's a lot of water. That is a lot of water. Imagine that water bill that you're paying every single month, if you if you have in-ground irrigation, of course, 60% of that is attributed to lawn and uh, landscape irrigation on average. Sometimes for some, it's significantly more. Others, it's significantly less. And it's very important to note that whether we're on irrigation that's coming from a reclaimed water source or it's from a well, we look at it as water is water. So we're still using water and it's a valuable resource for the state of Florida. And some of the impacts that we do see, like you can see on the image on the right, that is an algal bloom. And that's associated with increased levels of pollutants in the water like nitrogen or phosphorus that could impact and does impact our water quality significantly, can lead to fish kills, decline in, in water and aquatic habitats. So, and that can be and is also that our lawns and landscapes are part of that that contributes to it. So how we're managing our landscapes is vital because if we want Florida to be successful as an, as an economy, both for how we're making money as a state in tourism, as well as in tourism and agriculture, but as well as the economic viability, or sorry, the environmental viability of being able to live here with adequate water resources, we need to think about how we're managing our landscapes. So as, tar as far as part of today's program, I want us to be able to answer these two big questions. What is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program? I always talk about that is what is the FFL program and how does the FFL program work for my community? So we can say work for my community, work for our community, um, but it's important to know that FFL program is a great way that we can think about its role within our community. And that's what today's program is predominantly about. So first let's talk about what is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So we talked about increased water demands. We talked about the potential for non-point source pollutants impacts. And we just got to think about how do we balance that developed landscape where we're attractive, where people want to live with our resource needs and demands uh, within the environment and why we need water, et cetera. So Florida Friendly Landscaping, what is it? So it is an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. It's friendly to wildlife, it's environmentally responsible, and it's less work, and it can be less work than a traditional landscape. Ultimately, its goals really come back to conserving water and protecting water quality, um, you know, as well as helping reconnect wildlife habitat, et cetera. So there's a lot of different reasons why or goals as to why it exists, but ultimately it comes down to how are we maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. So maintenance is that key word. And that's really what the Florida Friendly Landscape really 
comes down to is how do we make sure that we're maintaining our landscapes appropriately to help conserve water and protect water quality. So to do that, we have these nine principles that are outlined in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. They include right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. So each one of these principles has a whole outline of like, how are we managing our landscapes? What are we doing in our landscapes, et cetera? But that first principle, right plant, right place, I think is the most critical principle of the entire FFL program. Because if we follow right plant, right place, immediately our landscapes can survive, they do much better. They significant. They have significant reduction of inputs that are required for them to maintain their health, et cetera. So right plant, right place is critical. We start with that. Everything else is really easy to do. So right plant, right place is really when we're thinking about planting our landscapes and selecting plants for our landscapes, we're matching those plants uh, to the environmental conditions of our site. So if we have our property has full sun or deep shade, we're going to make sure we're selecting plants that prefer full sun or deep shade. You know, other conditions we need to think about are, are um, the amount of moisture that they need. Are they drought tolerant? How big do they get? Because and if we're able to use those conditions in our landscape that we need to plant and find the plant that grows there well, naturally, then, um, then there'll be no problem with maintaining that landscape or that property. So, one moment. So there should be no problem uh, maintaining and reducing that landscape maintenance requirements for your property. So um, right plant, right place is where we best start. Another thing that we need to really think about is our environmental conditions. So environmental conditions, really thinking about climate and climate conditions is critical for our success. So thinking about this, in the chat box, what happened in December? <laughs> that might have an impact on our landscape plant decisions. Yeah, that hard freeze, freeze. Yeah, the freeze. The December freeze, that was a major issue, very, very major issue. But you know what? One of the things of, you know, a lot of our plants did suffer damage during that freeze in December. Absolutely. But a lot of our plants, majority of our plants recovered. So climate conditions or climate zone have a significant impact on our decision making. So in Nassau County, we are in what we call USDA hardiness zone. Uh, you're either in 9A or 8B. 9A is typically the east side of the county and 8B is the west side of the county. And if we selected plants that do well in that hardiness zone, that's great for North Florida or that 9A, 8B, those plants did totally fine during the freeze, suffered very little damage. Some probably died back, but then immediately started growing again. Um, and that's just because that's just, they're totally fine in those cool temperatures. But a lot of our tropical plants that aren't made for, you know, that 8B, 9A zone, some that might be in a higher region, kind of like a 10A, 10B, you know, more tropical, think more tropical plants, we lost a lot of those um, just because they weren't technically the right plant for the right place. Now, there are ways that you can help protect those plants, but nonetheless, it's important for us to think about climate zone. So if we think about right plant, right place, that is the beginning of making sure everything is going to work within our landscapes to make it be successful. So, um, so right plant, right place, watering efficiently really comes down to how much water are we putting down on our landscapes? You know, when we irrigate our landscapes, if we the best thing to do is just turn off your irrigation system completely. If you have one, just turn it off. Keep it turned off and only irrigate and water your plants during signs of drought. So we've had so much rain here recently. Um, 
because I mean, we're in the rainy season, it's been hot, but I, you know, me personally, I've had, I haven't had to run my uh, landscape irrigation at all because we've been getting plenty of water. I haven't, it's probably been two months, two and a half months since I've irrigated my landscape and everything's still looking happy and healthy, uh, but watering efficiently and like how much water do we need to put down? How do we put it down appropriately? Because you know, with a lot of our pop-up rotors, they do waste a lot of water and there's better ways to put um, uh, water onto our landscape, so. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. So someone from uh, South Southwest Florida is on here and it's, it's dry down there. I've heard that, yeah, yeah. We're lucky, we're, we've been having a lot of heat, but we're still getting our good, you know, our good rains that we usually get this time of year. So still have a little bit of dry periods here and there, but yeah, I've heard it's pretty dry down in Southwest Florida. So, <clears throat> so watering efficiently, that's a great way to really think about irrigation. How are we doing it? Because a lot of times, you know, when uh, local residents, homeowners, et cetera, they call our office because there's problems with their landscape. A lot of times we find out that just we're irrigating inappropriately. Either, and a lot of times it's too much when we can actually pull that irrigation back and it can improve our landscape significantly. So the next one is fertilize appropriately. Um, fertilizing, that really impacts, you know, the, any nitrogen or phosphorus that we put down on our soils, those contribute towards non-point source pollutants and those impacts that we see on our water bodies. So using soil tests, checking your pH and really understanding what are you putting down and does it meet the needs of your plants. So fertilizing is great, you know, when we need to apply it, but it's not always needed or making sure that when we're applying it regularly, we're applying it appropriately. So one of the big things that we see is phosphorus is a non-point source pollutant, and we, you can get that in a lot of our fertilizer bags. But Florida soil has a lot of high levels of phosphorus already that's bound in the soil, so there's no need to ever apply phosphorus unless you have a soil test saying that you're deficient, because otherwise you're putting down nutrients that are not needed in the landscape plants. Um, and then everything that you put down of that phosphorus is typically gone and moves through the soil pretty quickly and goes right into water bodies. But anyways, so knowing about fertilizing is going to be great. Mulch is very valuable. Mulch can help conserve water and suppress weeds to reduce a lot of our herbicides. Um, and how do we put landscape plants and select landscape plants to attract wildlife, such as food sources, water sources, place for them to get shelter, et cetera. Because if we can attract wildlife, we can help provide habitat for a lot of our pollinators, birds, et cetera, to our properties to help with that fragmenting landscape. Um, so managing yard pests is the sixth principle. And that really talks about, we have pests in our landscapes and our gardens, our yards, et cetera. It happens, but how do we manage them appropriately? And managing yard pests can be a way for us to, if we're, Starting with right plant, right place, our plants are going to be actually naturally resilient to a lot of those stressors and those pests that we don't, so we don't have to manage them. But when we have stressed plants, we start to see increased pests. So usually if we can make sure that the plant is managed well, we're not going to have much of a pest issue where it's going to be significantly less. So we're not going to be dependent on a different types of pesticides uh, applied to a landscape. We can significantly reduce its usage. So next is recycle. So recycling is thinking about composting. How do we use leaf litter? Use it for our mulch, let it break down, build our soil, make a healthier soil. And if we can recycle a lot of those nutrients in our landscape, it helps us reduce our fertilizer use also. So reducing stormwater runoff is our eighth principle. So a lot of our stormwater will capture and convey a lot of pollutants out into our water bodies. So we can reduce stormwater runoff by capturing it in rain barrels, cisterns, or have uh, rain gardens, et cetera, all these different ways where we can capture that water. And then the plants can absorb a lot of that moisture as well as they can help clean a lot of that water too before entering the water in any waterways. Um, and then the next is protecting the waterfront. The ninth principle is thinking about how do we have a 10 foot no to low use buffer around all water bodies because turf grass right down to a water um, water body is a really bad idea. <laughs> There's other ways that we can maintain that buffer because that gap, that space is a high pollutant contamination area that yard clippings, fertilizers, or any types of pesticides easily gets into water bodies. So we want a 10 foot no to low maintenance buffer. And that buffer can be ornamental plants, 
use nice massing shrubs, beautiful flowering plants, put it along that edge, keep it nice and low so you can still look out, but then it reduces any type of maintenance that you have along that pond edge. It has a significant impact on water quality by helping protect it and improve it, and it can significantly increase the quality of things just as simple as like a retention pond. So it's wonderful. So protecting the waterfront, what are the smart ways that we can plan and maintain those edges around water bodies to help protect that water quality because then those plants can absorb a lot of the moisture and pollutants before they enter the water body and contaminate and contribute towards any type of pollutant source. So those are the nine principles, right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pest, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff and protect the waterfront. But most importantly, you start with right plant, right place, everything else comes and makes it much easier. So that's the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Um, and there's a lot of details that we can spend in each one of these principles, but it's important to have an understanding of what this is, especially we're gonna be talking about its role in our community. So, um, it's an, I want to bring up part of the conversation is, you know, the FFL program is actually held within state statute. Um, and in that state statute, um, the, the one that's commonly cited is statute 373-185, where it says deed restrictions, covenants, or local ordinances cannot prohibit implementation of floor-friendly floor -friendly practices. Um, and, you know, but that's not assigned to a specific agency enforced by a not enforced by a court system. And it's difficult to determine what is and is not FFL because the program is broad and subjective. So, you know, an HOA can require you to do certain landscape practices. And if it's Florida friendly, you know, that's what you're, you have to do, um, even if you want to do a separate Florida friendly practice. So it's, you know, usually education can help clarify that by talking with county extension agents when there's a conflict and understanding. But anyways, so we see that within the Florida statute, but we do have a lot of discussions on how HOA restrictions on FFL, so deed restrictions and covenants are in place within HOAs to help protect property values, and they can often dictate specific plants from the floor for the landscaping uh, like plant list that homeowners must use, and even percent cover of specific plants. So there are a lot of um, Part of our discussion today will be centered not completely around HOAs, but will include HOAs as part of this discussion, because when we're living within our communities, whether it's in an HOA or non-HOA, we're really bound by what are our codes and covenances within our counties or our communities, but what are some type of restrictions or architectural review board requirements, bylaws, et cetera, for where we live that we need to think about as part of creating Florida-friendly landscapes or helping communities adopt different Florida friendly landscaping principles and practices. So I do want to bring up this. So we do have different Florida friendly uh, landscaping program resources, and these are all on our web page. And don't worry, I will send this out to everybody attending today as part of the follow up for the program, all those links and etc. But whenever you think about you know, usually when I'm working with a lot of homeowners, you know, when we see the floor friendly landscaping program, we really think about that area, that home landscape. So these are going to be like more of like the residential. So homeowners, best management practices, et cetera. So the master gardener volunteers, this is where they're focusing their efforts is how to work with residents and homeowners for best management practices when on their properties. Um, but the program just isn't for residents. It's not just a residential decision-making thing, but we have from a statewide perspective, the uh, with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, you know, the residential component, we have Florida Friendly for community landscapes, as well as Florida Friendly Landscaping for landscape professionals. So very briefly, the landscaping professionals, essentially any person that applies fertilizer commercially in the state, so any of those companies that you hire and they apply fertilizer, they have to have the green industry's best management practices training certification. And that is strictly through the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And it is required by law that they have to have that certification in order to be applying those fertilizers. So we have that whole program for FFL for landscape professionals on how can green industry professionals use FFL in that commercial setting. But for us, 
Today's program is going to be focusing on that FFL for community landscapes. And the reason this is valuable and important is because as homeowners, we have the ability to speak with our local leaders. We have the ability to speak with our community members, our leaders, whomever it might be within maybe an HOA, et cetera, to have these discussions about border friendly landscape implementation within com uh, common spaces, community spaces, et cetera, because that can have a significant impact um, statewide. So when you actually click on the FFL for Communities uh, link, it brings you to this other page where we actually look at it from, again, multiple facets. So when we're looking at FFL for Community Landscapes, we have programs specifically for community and property managers. Um, we have programs we're specifically working with builders and developers. That's actually a new one that we're kind of building currently as we speak, as well as we have programs and education like how do we work, work with those local governments making, you know, land use changes, land use policy, et cetera. So um, going into the chat real quick, are any of you by any chance on a uh, on a landscape board with an HOA or a community or anything like that? Or do you work with your HOA board? And you can put that in the chat box. So did any of you also, do you, um, any of you live in an HOA where you have to deal with property management teams, um, community association managers, et cetera? Yeah. So a lot of you said yes, a couple of you said no. So I think that's gonna be important because there are some of the things that we talk about are gonna be talking about the realm of the HOA, but not really, cause all, you know, we'll put some focus on HOA, but all of it is relevant, um, whether you're in an HOA or not, just because sometimes that decision-making can be a little different within an HOA compared to someplace that is not in an HOA, but we'll talk about each one of those. So, um, it's, so it's important, though, as a homeowner, you know, whether it's with your local government, those decision lead makers, community association make, uh, managers, or if you are working with a builder or developer, you can have these discussions about what is a Florida friendly landscape. So we're going to jump in to um, kind of just to connect the dots. That's what I want to do. Let's kind of connect a little bit of the dots and then we'll kind of explain go into like responsibilities and then I'll show some of the additional um oh that's cool so in the chat boxes yeah so uh they don't live in HOA but local ordinances require 75 percent native plants for all new construction that's really cool so we do know that you know HOA set a lot of the rules requ requirements but we do have a lot of counties and local municipalities they're adopting their own land use uh requirements um, for our landscapes. Um, and sometimes they're going to be Florida friendly. Sometimes they may not necessarily be, but they usually are more pointing toward Florida friendly. So that's kind of cool. So 75% native plants requirement for new construction, you know, that could be a double, double edged sword because, um, you know, with the Florida friendly landscaping program, it's right plant, right place. So it can be uh, non native or native. And the biggest time that we'll start to see. You know, if homeowners want to do native, go for it. It's great. It's wonderful. Use native plants as long as the right plant, right place. We do find in some situations, the soil conditions can be so disturbed that establishing native plants can actually be very, very difficult, uh, but not always. But that's really, that's really cool that they're making that effort to try to, how do we implement these be different best management practices within our community? But um, anyways, so connecting the dots. FFL for community landscapes. So how does a homeowner fit in all this? So if we're thinking about this higher order thinking of, you know, decision makers, policy makers, et cetera, 
you know, it's really important to think is you as the homeowner, ultimately one that has the ultimate voice, which is great. Um, and it's how do we communicate it? So when we look at it, this is just super nutshell, very like not as detailed as it could be, but it's just a short little snapshot. So as a homeowner, if you live in an HOA, you're usually working with, you know, a community association manager. They're going to be the person that's just kind of helping coordinate and organize and work with the community. Um, and they kind of bridge the community, the HOA board, you know, to anybody that they hire. And that as well as be like landscape maintenance contractor, those landscape contractors that are doing all the work in and around the, the, the community. So as well as in the HOAs, this is always a point of discussion that people ask questions about is we have our HOA board. And with a lot of our land use change and new developments, um, eight, we have our HOA boards. And HOA boards are typically what we call like builder controlled. And they, those boards are predominantly uh, controlled by the builder until there's 90% build out of a community and 90%. And after that, point that 90 percent then it becomes homeowner controlled where you're high where homeowners have majority on that board um and if not 100 percent um on that board once there's 100 percent build out but nonetheless they have majority on the board so um when you're looking in hoa those are a lot of those key uh individuals or, uh, that we work with now of course you're still in an hoa you're subject to city county codes and ordinances but typically you know that's going to be maintained by the HOA and you're subject to those uh, bylaws etc a restriction set up by the HOA but if you're in not in an HOA typically you're bound by city county codes and ordinances and of course other things that could impact it could you know water management district requirements regulations etc but again in a nutshell this is kind of what we're looking at um, because Ultimately, in an HOA, the community association manager and the landscape maintenance, they work for the homeowners, and the board is that elected representative pool of homeowners that are the voice, the elected voice of the community, um, but ultimately, the homeowners are the ones that have that voice. So when we look at the development types, you know, we have that nine, I kind of break it up as like nine HOA, HOA, and then sometimes we'll have things like condominium associations where you know, you live in a condominium, but you're not really managing or you might be even living within a um, HOA where you don't manage anything outside the walls of your building. It's 100% managed by the HOA. So there's a lot of variability. So we really look about who is responsible for the HOA or the condominium association. You know, is the HOA responsible for maintaining community and common spaces and the spaces around the homes? Is the homeowner the one responsible? And then what level of involvement is required? So there's a lot of variability that exists in how we manage landscapes, but it always comes back to those homeowners, those property owners on the parcels. So I want to kind of show a couple resources as homeowners, property owners, if you're working within your community, you can work and there are strategies that you can work towards to make your community Florida friendly. So these are the strategies essentially is, you know, you want to make a Florida friendly landscape. These are the different types of resources for your community that are available. So I want to go ahead and let me switch my share screen really quick. I'll pull up a slightly different screen. It'll blip. All right. So this web page um, has a lot of great resources, and it is on our uh, FFL web page. When you look at, when you click on, you know, the community association and like how to make your community floor friendly. But some of the things that I think are going to be very valuable as homeowners is how do we work with our community and what resources are available to allow our community to make Florida friendly decisions? And there's a lot of different text on here. So we're just going to ignore most of it. But on here, we have design and maintenance guidelines, you know, kind of like the green industry professional requirements. We even have certification where professionals can actually become a Florida friendly landscaping certified professional that they've gone through an extensive training in Florida friendly landscape maintenance and management where they get to they get that specific certification that they then have to maintain which is a really nice uh, way for them to market themselves as well um, as well as being a consumer you're saying oh they've gone through this additional training 
they are a Florida friendly landscape certified professional. So when we actually, I'm going to come down here and look at some of these different resources that we do have. So obviously the Florida friendly landscaping program is held within uh, state state statute and legislation, et cetera. And this is actually shortcuts on this page that take us to that specific legislation and verbiage, et cetera. But down here where we have these guidelines for HOA codes and documents, these are some of the very valuable resources that we have as homeowners to share with our HOAs or our community leaders in this decision-making to help adopt specific Florida-friendly landscape practices. Now, it's really nice. You know, when we're thinking about trying to make these changes, it doesn't need to be our community makes community-wide changes, but what are those little changes that we can make? Maybe one area we start to implement these Florida-friendly landscaping practices, or maybe it's just as simple as a conversation with that property management uh, community association management, the landscape management company is like, hey, we want to adopt these different changes. You know, how do we make sure that we're managing following these very specific practices? And these documents on here can actually give us a lot of those tips and tricks as part of having that conversation and having those resources that allow us to implement some of those changes. So one thing that I really like is up at the top, um, we have model covenants and conditions and restrictions for HOA. So we can actually in here, in this document, we have these model uh, model covenants conditions on how to implement Florida friendly landscaping programming within a community. Um, and it goes into a lot of background about the program, but then it goes, um, let me get down to this point but it goes into ways that we have the ability. So model provisions for new communities. So this, all this language, these are just model language that HOAs have the ability to adopt if they're doing updates, their covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Sometimes it's, you know, this can be very difficult to do. It, this part, changing the actual covenants and conditions, restrictions can be very, very difficult. So typically the easiest way is communities will make these changes in their bylaws. And the bylaws are much easier to make those changes to compared to these covenants and restrictions, but the same language can apply and be helpful help in that use. But it goes through what Florida friendly landscaping is and the actual code and language and language and verbiage that can be used to help implement some of these Florida friendly landscaping practices to make sure that the community and the community members are following these best practices. So um, anyways, so this is a wonderful resource to help show the community that's like, hey, you know, we don't have to start from scratch. If we want to make these changes, we have this verbiage that already exists that allows us to maybe how do we how do we make sure it fits for us? So um, the next one is the model ordinance for Florida, Florida friendly fertilizers use on urban landscapes. Some of our communities and counties uh, across the state have different fertilizer ordinances and restrictions. Um, we don't have any in Nassau County. The only one, you know, that that we're really always promoting in um, through our extension offices is, you know, not applying fertilizer during the dormancy period, you know, especially to our turf grass species, because, well, our plants aren't growing. So if, if they're not growing during that time of dormancy, they don't need nutrients and fertilizer. Otherwise, it's all contributed to pollutants. But some parts of the state have additional, um, have additional restrictions, such as rainy season restrictions, et cetera. So we did have one question come in. It says, are there any speakers available for FFL that would come speak to HOA community residents such as mine? Absolutely. Yes. Your county extension agent. Um, so I, I do that conversation actually all the time with HOAs um, and have those conversations with community association managers and HOA boards, et cetera. So it's part of my extension program here in Nassau County um, and a lot of extension agents across the state who are Florida friendly landscaping uh, extension agents or horticulture agents do that same thing. So absolutely, absolutely. So that's a great resource from our county extension offices. We can come to you all as an HOA. Um, I've done that a couple times um, with different HOAs all across Nassau County, probably eight or nine different HOAs at different times. So and multiple times as well for some of them. But anyways, great question. So other documents that can pop up include um, you know, considerations for guidelines for architectural review boards. So this is another great resource. Um, and this just kind of gives just general outlines, 
you know, existing communities what to consider for floor friendly landscaping guidelines. Again, it allows it so homeowners don't have to start from scratch or HOA to start from scratch. We give a lot of a list and this all, all this data comes from, you know, is organized based off of each principle. So um, all these resources, again, just to help HOAs make those decisions so they just to make it easier. The language already exists. So um, here's a document. I can send this one out. I really like this one is Florida Friendly Landscaping Guidelines for Community Associations. Considerations for selecting a landscape contractor and writing an effective landscape contract. So if you're on your landscape board or you're on your HOA board and you're trying to hire green industry professionals, this is a great way to make sure that within the contracts, you are... Um, making sure that they are following Florida friendly landscaping principles. So I will send this document out to everybody because it's very, very helpful and handy. And I've worked with a lot of HOAs as they're looking for new landscape contractors. We use that document as a way for them to kind of, how do we write our contract? How do we make sure we're selecting the most appropriate landscape contractor for us to achieve our goals as a community? So, um, <clears throat> And then you can actually, we have model contracts. Oh, that's the wrong one. See. So here's a model contract. You can actually download as a Word document, which is really cool from this web page. This is just the PDF of it. So again, it goes through contract language, et cetera. So you can edit it, update it, make it your own as a community. But this is that model contract that you can actually use in that selecting for a landscape contractor, which is awesome. Again, so you don't have to re you don't have to reinvent invent the wheel. Um, we have those resources already with you or for you. Um, so other things that we have is underneath this contracting a landscape maintenance company. So um, again, a lot of that information about how to write those contracts, but also you can actually search our online database of all our green industry professionals. So um, I'll go to this website real quick. It's loading. So um, certificate, certificate search. So you can actually look by specific um, individuals or the companies, but statewide we have 62,135 green industry professionals that are registered. So um, I can type in Nassau, Nassau County or your city, et cetera. This is everybody, their name, certification, who they work for, et cetera, um, for the green industry program that's within our area. So here I am. I was first certified in 2019. I'm an instructor um, and I got my certification in Gainesville. So that's why it's listed that way. But anyways, so this is a great way to like, I'm working with a company and I don't, I want to know if they have their green industry GIB and P license. You can just search them up on this database, which is really nice. Or you can come to this database and see what companies are servicing your area that have those certifications. So then that can help you have a targeted search when you're looking for contracts um, with the uh, those specific uh, green industry professionals. And then down here, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, but community design resources. You know, sometimes thinking about designing and planning a landscape can be daunting. It can be a little overwhelming. Absolutely. These resources kind of try to take a lot of that guesswork out of that to help, whether it's you're an individual homeowner trying to make these decisions or if you are working with your community to try to, how do we create, you know, different design strategies to implement and adopt different Florida friendly landscaping? Because, you know, even though GIB, or sorry, even though the FFL program, we're really looking at maintenance, you know, we do think about aesthetics and design as part of that as well. So you can achieve your aesthetic goals through Florida friendly landscaping, no problem, you know, but when you're making big changes, it's nice to have those resources to help with the actual design itself. So these resources are unbelievably handy and you can spend all day going through these, but I send these documents a lot of times to HOA boards, community association managers, ARB board members, um, et cetera, just because it's like, if you have questions about your HOA, how do we make these management decisions? What are resources available? 
this is what I share a lot to those uh, who I'm in contact with. So, so let's go ahead and we'll jump back to the slideshow. Any questions about the uh, those resources? It's one of the wonderful things is you're having this discussion with your board, like, hey, here's model language. It's done. You know, we can just make tweak it adjustments, do what we need to do as a community to achieve your community's goals and still be Florida friendly or work towards becoming Florida friendly. So. All right. So when I think about Florida friendly for community landscapes, you know, we're not just thinking about our community as in general, but we want to make sure that we're modeling ourselves as, you know, maybe leaders. Um, oh, yes, yes, I am going to provide a list of all these in a follow up email where all this is located. So yes, great question. Um, so we can work towards making these community decisions to adopt sort of friendly landscaping practices, but such it's important and valuable for us is like, you know, how can we adopt these different principles as well to make our yard Florida friendly. So there's, there's an EDIS publication or a, a publication through the University of Florida that is kind of highlights 10 strategies to help make your yard Florida friendly. And I'll, I'll make sure I send that to you as part of the list of resources. But these 10 strategies are just, you know, simple, just become familiar with FFLs. Like what is a Florida friendly landscaping program? You know, understand the FFL state law, because sometimes you don't, you don't have to know it to be, you don't have to be a lawyer, but you know, if understanding it and reading and just awareness of it is gonna be valuable. Um, Become familiar with your HOA landscaping rules and regulations. What kind of restrictions do you have? Having that familiarity can really help you in that design and decision making for your property in your community. Observe landscapes in your community. What are people doing that's doing well? What's not? You know, can that influence our decision making or have a better understanding of, you know, what are those Florida friendly landscape practices that are doing best here? Um, look at other Florida friendly landscapes in other communities. That's another thing is, um, and I'll show you that resource online. We have a very brief list of um, other FFL communities across the state or uh, homes, et cetera. And we even have a few that are here in Nassau County that's worth going and visit and seeing if possible. Um, <clears throat> others, oh no, I duplicated the wrong side. Well. Um, I'll send it out. So the, the best thing is the next strategies, um, you know, is we want to become familiar with FFLs, understand state law, HOAs, you know, study FFLs in other communities, but start thinking about your landscape, you know, understand your landscape. We call it an inventory and analysis. Draw pictures of your landscape. Where are those environmental, different environmental conditions, sun, shade, good views, bad views? How does it impact you? And then you can start to think about, okay, where are those landscape plants that can do well in my landscape and do they fit well with the rules and requirements of my HOA? You know, how then think about how can you sketch out that landscape plan? Because if you can create a comprehensive landscape plan, that makes it easier for you to be able to submit and communicate with that architectural review board or whoever has to make the decision to say you're within compliance or not. And it's really important to have this conversation early, have it frequently with those board members to kind of let them know that you want to make changes and why you want to make those changes, have a clear understanding and description of your yard, your landscapes and its goals. So those board members have a really good understanding of why you're wanting to do what you're doing. And you can start to think, is my landscape compliant? Is it not with those requirements? What are some of those things that I might not be in compliance with, but maybe we can work with them to kind of work out a good solution to it? Um, or are there situations where an HOA is requiring you to do something that's not Florida friendly? Um, yeah, so you have to take sheet flow into account. Great. So, you know, sheet flow is going to be very important, but a lot of times, do you have to do sheet flow calculations for your HOA or just from a developer perspective or like with like zoning? requirements because at least with our when we're thinking about sheet flow we have to think about um you know what's leaving our property as part of reducing stormwater runoff as well as um not increasing sheet flow or to help 
Okay, so zoning and certificate of occupancy. So that's a lot that has to do with that zoning requirement for builders and developers. Yeah, so sheet flow is always going to be important, and that's a common thing um, for you know typically little changes for HOA for homeowners just for minor landscape things. You know, that's not always going to be a major change that they have to do. But when we start talking about grading and drainage requirements for zoning and certificate of occupancy, yeah, you do have to take sheet flow into consideration as part of storm drainage calculations and storm storm runoff. So great point. So for when you're working again, so make these decisions, you start drawing out, sketching out your ideas, but have that open communication with your community, your HOA about these changes that you want to make. So make sure that you're staying in compliance. Um, and that's a fantastic thing. So we do have our, um, we have our community landscape pattern books, which is great as a simple resource. It is on that design considerations and um, that we have on our webpage where you can actually, we have design books based off of what zone that you live in. And in those design books, it kind of gives you just simple design ideas and suggested plant palettes and plant lists based off of those environmental conditions in your landscape. So it can help take a lot of guesswork out of that creating that design for your property. So, um, or how to create those just landscape changes for your property, because, you know, sometimes design for some is easy, others it may not be. And this is actually just a snapshot from uh, that web page where we, um, or from that document that has that pattern book. So I'll make sure that you do uh, have this within that email follow-up. So it's just a handy resource in helping create that change to help make your yard forward friendly. And another step, the thing that we can do is we can actually get our landscapes and our properties recognized as a Florida-friendly landscape. So Florida-friendly landscapes, we can look at it from the perspective of homeowners, commercial and common uh, properties, as well as new construction. So uh, myself or some of the trained Master Gardener volunteers, we can actually come to properties and we actually have a recognition checklist that we can run through that we use as a way to kind of say, are you Florida-friendly or not? And um, there's different levels that we can provide in that recognition. And that includes like a silver and a gold. There's been talks about using a platinum uh, level for a friendly landscaping recognition, but we haven't gotten there yet. I think it's just still talks about it. But nonetheless, you can get your homeowner, your property in your home, recognize a floor friendly. But we also have a separate checklist for commercial landscapes or those common spaces within communities and HOAs, um, as well as looking at new construction. So we're actually looking at building, building and development, builder and developer documents, those construction documents to kind of determine, are they implementing Florida-friendly landscaping practices, you know, before they even install the landscape. We can actually recognize those new construction. I've done a couple of those, um, not too many, but that's a great way to kind of be more proactive in our landscaping response because it'd be best if we all properties when newly constructed started as a Florida friendly landscape, but that's not always the case. So we have these different levels of recognition and each one of them have slightly different checklists of things that we look for uh, based off of the use. Um, so you know, here's an image of one of our Florida friendly landscapes across the state and we actually have statewide awards that we work on um, and or that you can actually get recognized for. So each year homeowners will be like the Florida Friendly Landscape of the Year Award or a Community Association of the Year Award. But here in Nassau County, we've had a few uh, communities that are working towards trying to adopt and get these different um, recognitions. So one example is the um, here in Nassau County is Highland Dunes. So Highland Dunes, which is over on Amelia Island, um, they have like a community garden space um, that they have towards the front of their community. And they've been working on that garden for a few years. I was actually in grad school and I met with them years ago when they first started making changes out there. But nonetheless, they've been maintaining it. And um, recently we were able to recognize that as a Florida Friendly Landscape, a gold community landscape. You know, it's not the entire community, of course, but it's one part of that common space that we're able to recognize as a Florida-friendly landscape, and that was a huge success. We have um, another one that we're working with right now. Um, it is the Amelia Surf and Racquet Club, um, and we've been making changes and working with them, and they're 
they're looking at trying to get to the uh, the entire community recognized as a Florida friendly landscape. Um, and that's been a really fun process working with them to get towards that. Um, and that's one of those instances where we're working with board members, landscape managers, the property management association, homeowners. So it's kind of a unique that, you know, everybody's involved because it's part of that community discussion. But there's different ways that we can work towards getting these uh, these recognitions. And I'll quickly show, um, I can pull up real quick a recognition checklist. Just to kind of show you briefly what it what it looks like. Because again, this um, this document is just on our web pages, so you can pull it up and use it as your own self audit of your community, kind of figure out what's working, what's not working, how, what are improvements that I need to make. So in this recognition process, we have our homeowner checklist, our common, our commercial and common area checklist, our new construction checklist, um, and then we actually you have to get re recognized every two years. Um, and there's a different process at four years to make sure that you're still managing it. Just because you're FFL one moment doesn't mean that you're following the best management practices two or four years down the road. So uh, here is the example of the homeowner checklist. And there are situations like here in Nassau County, what we do is myself or a team of Master Gardener volunteers, we, can, we come out to your property and we actually do this checklist and we do this recognition process to kind of determine, do you meet all the benchmarks to be a floor friendly landscape? And I usually take this checklist a lot with me when I do site visits because it allows us to like look at a landscape critically. It's like, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well on? What can we improve upon? So then we get, it gives us a goal to start working towards something. So um, this checklist is super handy tool because then we can figure out what are our gaps, how can we implement changes gradually to help just improve ourselves just a little bit at a time. So on this, this is the home landscape recognition checklist, um, and it goes into, you know, required practices for silver, you have to meet all these requirements. If there's irrigation system present, um, turf grass, aesthetic requirements. Um, and then if you want to make sure you get gold, you have to accomplish all these as well. But then you have to go through and you have to approve or you have to make sure that you're doing certain number of these different principles or practices from each principle. So, for example, right plant, right place. So for principle one, you have to get three for silver and four for gold. So some of them are like, you know, trees and shrubs are positioned to improve the building's heating and cooling capacity if space allows. You know, erosion prone areas are managed to minimize erosion. So there's some of these other checklists and you have to make sure that, you know, are you achieving three, um, at least three of those items. So we have that checklist for each principle that then we go through to make sure that we are indeed following Florida friendly best management practices. But again, I'll send this checklist out. Well, I'll send out the page to the checklist because just having this visible to be able to look through allows you to just do critical thinking of your landscapes and the communities that you're in to kind of say, what are we missing? What's not doing well? Can we improve our landscape? So these are wonderful, handy dandy little resources. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. This is gonna be the last screen, um, share screen switch, I swear. All right, so <clears throat> when we look at the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, you know, this year is our 30th anniversary. So it actually started back in 1993. And what you can do, as I'll send you all a link to, is you could take a pledge. What are you going to do this year? It could be as minimal as like, I'm going to make sure I'm using an approved mulch. I'm going to irrigate less. I'm going to make sure I'm following right plant, right place. But go sign the pledge. Tell us what you're going to do this year to kind of show that, like, hey, I'm going to do my best as a Flor Floridian, Nassau County resident, or wherever you're living. Is like, try to implement these practices and try to show that I'm trying to put my best foot forward. So we're kind of using that as like a way this year to kind of sign the pledge, celebrate our 30th anniversary. Um, but, you know, when we think about the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it's not just residents. It's not just those homeowners. It's anything and everything in the landscape. So homeowners, our community landscapes, our green industry professionals, or those landscape professionals. The Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is broad, and how we use it 
is our ultimate goal is to think about Florida and our natural resources and those goals of water quality and water conservation. We do have some apps that are available that I really like. You can scan the QR code if you have your phone handy. If uh, you can open up the screen, I'll send this link out, of course. Um, but we have a plant selection guide. That plant selection guide is great because you can actually select all the environmental conditions of your landscape and it'll give you a list of suggested plants, which is fantastic. So it can help take out a lot of the guesswork. But we also have a fertilizer ordinance app. Florida Toxic Plants app, a Butterfly Gardens app, and a, uh, a app and a Bee Gardens app. So we have a lot of really cool resources to try to help homeowners, property owners, community associations. Just how can we make these educated decisions? Make sure that we're looking at appropriate resources. So a lot of these exist now. And that online uh, plant guide is the same thing as that we have as a book. That's a plant selection book, but that plant guide is going to be expanding and growing significantly over time, the app that we have. So it's relatively new, but it will grow and continue to grow. Another really cool thing is, have any of you ever seen Flip My Florida Yard on TV? You can put that in the chat box, yes or no. Because it does show on WJCT or in Jacksonville on Saturdays, which is really cool. It doesn't show all across the state, I believe. But um, Flip My Florida Yard is a partnership with FDEP. Um, the Discovery Network, not to be confused with like Discovery Channel, but the Discovery Network um, and the University of Florida. And what we do is it's just like a home makeover show where we go into someone's property and one day we take it and we flip it and turn it into a Florida friendly landscape. And it is chaos. It is organized chaos. It is exhausting. It is a total amount of fun. So every episode, we're talking about Florida friendly landscaping, the practices, you'll see the extension agent from the county that we're filming in. Um, and then the host, uh, of course, Chad, he's, he's there as part of it. So it's a really kind of cool way. Um, that week, yeah, right. And they do calls. If you follow them, like on Instagram or Facebook, or go onto the web page, they'll do their posts. Like, you want to be on Flip My Florida Yard? You have to fill out your application and all that stuff. Um, and it, that's really fun. I got to do season one, episode one. Um, and by the end of the day, I just felt like I was just going to lay on the ground because I was so exhausted. But it was it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. But it's a cool way that we're kind of marketing and promoting the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and like a mass media type of audience. But you can go onto their website and you can pull up clips on YouTube, etc. But anyways, look for Flip My Florida Yard. Um, I need to double check, but I'm pretty sure it's the Saturdays at 1130 on uh, Jacksonville's WJCT. So, um, so check it out. DVR it. <laughs> um, but anyways, so going back, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, it's for everybody. Statewide, if you're doing anything outside, outdoors, managing our landscapes, thinking about Florida, Florida's natural resources, why we love Florida. We love Florida because the beaches, the water, you know, the natural resources, the environment, our entire state's economy is dependent off of water quality and quantity. So for agricultural food production, our tourism industry, we need water for it. And the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a great way that we can help preserve and protect or conserve and protect the Florida that we know and the Florida that we love. So following these principles, you know, whether it's one thing to do today, the next, the other, as long as we're making those decisions, whether for an individual purpose, we're sharing it with our community members, we're trying to work with our HOAs or community leaders to make these decisions, we can just look at these little things, the low hanging fruit, one small step to another small step, and we can do that by following these uh, nine principles. So now we're, we're looping back towards the end. We should now, you all should now be able to comfortably answer what is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and how does the FFL program work for and in my community? Um, so here is my contact information. Um, feel free to at anytime reach out to me um, ask questions if you are working with your HOA um, you know reach out to me as well now of course I, we do have some participants who are not from Nassau County so you know reach out to your county extension office because the horticulture extension agent will be doing a lot of those very similar projects and they would love to help work with you so um, thank you all very much and we do have time for some questions, and I'm trying to copy a link to share to you all, but it's not working, so I'm going to have to do this.